In the intricate tapestry of political thought, the concept of liberty stands as a beacon of human aspiration, illuminating the path towards individual autonomy and societal flourishing. While the notion of liberty has been dissected, debated, and reshaped over centuries, two distinct perspectives have emerged, negative liberty and positive liberty. In this video we will examine the realm of positive liberty by exploring its implications and significance in shaping a society. Negative liberty, often championed by classical liberals, emphasizes the absence of external constraints on one's actions. It is the freedom to act without interference from others, whether individuals, institutions, or the state. Positive liberty, on the other hand, takes a more nuanced approach, focusing on the individual's ability to control their own life and realize their full potential. It is the power to act, to shape one's destiny, and to pursue self-determination. The distinction between negative and positive liberty was described by Isaiah Berlin in his 1958 essay, Two Concepts of Liberty. Berlin argued that positive liberty, which he described as freedom to, complements negative liberty, which he termed freedom from. Berlin asserted that negative liberty is concerned with the avoidance of interference. He cites John Stuart Mill's famous harm principle, which states that the only justification for limiting individual liberty is to prevent harm to others. In contrast, Berlin posits positive liberty as the ability to act as one's own master, to shape one's own life and destiny. He associates positive liberty with thinkers such as Rousseau and Hegel, who argued that individuals can only be truly free if they are able to participate in the collective governance of society. So, what are the fundamental pillars of positive liberty? The first pillar is to have the necessary resources to act. Without the means to pursue one's goals, freedom becomes an empty promise. What are some of these resources that enable individuals to exercise their positive liberty? Access to quality education and ongoing knowledge empowers individuals to understand their choices, make informed decisions, and navigate complex social and political landscapes. Without this, one may not even realize they have choices and may make decisions based on faulty assumptions or limited information. A stable and just economic and political system provides individuals with the means to pursue their goals, free from the constraints of enforced serfdom corrupt legal systems or opportunities limited by class or ethnicity. As we will discuss in a moment, this aspect is where there is a lot of controversy and debate. The second pillar, the capacity to act, encompasses the individual's ability to make informed decisions, navigate social structures, and overcome internal obstacles. This requires the cultivation of self-awareness, resilience, and critical thinking skills. One aspect of this is taking on active participation in civic life and political processes to enable individuals to influence decisions that shape their lives and communities. Apathy is the act of removing one's self from civic life, essentially giving up their liberty. Another aspect, an internal one, is developing the ability to make choices, develop one's own values, and live according to one's own principles. This is essential for developing a sense of positive liberty. Positive liberty has far-reaching implications for the structure of society. It calls for a reassessment of social norms, institutions, and power dynamics that hinder individuals from achieving their full potential. Social inequalities, economic disparities, and discriminatory practices all pose significant barriers to positive liberty. A society that embraces positive liberty must strive to create an environment where individuals, regardless of their background or circumstances, have the opportunity to develop their talents, pursue their aspirations, and contribute meaningfully to their communities. Some believe that to achieve this it would necessitate a commitment to social justice, redistribution of resources, and the empowerment of marginalized groups. However, others point out that this must be carefully balanced to avoid taking liberty, for example, the freedom of speech, away from others in the process. As we can see, the pursuit of positive liberty is not without its challenges. 
The discourse surrounding positive liberty highlights the delicate balance between individual autonomy and societal responsibility. Critics argue that an overemphasis on positive liberty can lead to an overreach of state power, infringing upon individual freedoms and undermining the very foundation of liberty itself. They caution against the dangers of paternalism and the potential for social engineering or even eugenics. Proponents of positive liberty maintain that individual freedoms are not absolute and must be balanced against the collective well-being of society. They argue that a substantial degree of intervention is necessary to address structural inequalities and empower all individuals to exercise their positive liberty meaningfully, even when it curtails the liberty of others. In the realm of politics, positive liberty suggests that governments have a responsibility to create the conditions necessary for individuals to exercise their freedom. Most constitutional governments at least pay lip service to this idea. However, there is considerable debate over how far governments should go to achieve this goal as well as if it's just words on paper. While most, but not all, will agree on things like education and a fair and unbiased economic and legal system, there is considerable debate beyond this. For example, to what degree should the government be involved in providing health care and other social services? Should the government not only ensure equal opportunities for all citizens but also address inequalities that occurred in the past? As you can see, many of our current political and cultural debates have their roots in trying to implement positive liberty. Finding balanced resolutions to these conflicts will be difficult, especially given the current political polarization. On an individual level, positive liberty encourages self-reflection and personal growth. It challenges individuals to examine their own values, aspirations, and limitations, and to strive for self-actualization. Positive liberty is not merely about being free from external constraints. It is about actively shaping one's own life and pursuing one's fullest potential by eliminating internal constraints. In my opinion, this internalized view of positive liberty is the most valuable. Even if not all external constraints are removed and even if they remain significant, it is still empowering someone to act as agents of their own destiny, to pursue their goals and aspirations, and to contribute to the betterment of society. This is what leaders such as Gandhi and Martin Luther King did in spite of the difficult external obstacles they faced. What's your take on positive liberty? Do you think it's possible to balance freedom to, and freedom from, liberty? Or, must one take precedence over the other? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Please give me a like if you enjoyed this video and please comment to let me know your thoughts on it. Also, check out our other videos about other philosophical topics.